Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start our worship and our hymn on this morning. Page 147. How great thou art. You are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Psalm 86.
good to see all of you. Um, our morning prayer is going to be Psalm 86, just for your information. We're going to be reading the first 10 verses in that particular song. Let me say a few things uh, this morning. Um, next week, uh, I'm going to, uh, or next Sunday morning, I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing this summer as we're going to be doing what we call a more confessional style of worship. And it's really the worship um, that took place in the first century church. Uh, so you're going to experience a little bit of how uh, Paul and Peter and the first century church would have worshiped when they uh, gathered together. And it's going to consist of some songs, but also confessing the great creeds of the church. I'll explain a little bit, little bit of the history behind that, how we know how they worship, and uh, uh, and I, I really think this will let you know where you are spiritually because if we uh, conduct ourselves in this form of worship and uh, you say, I don't like it, then I think you have a problem because this is really the way the Lord, by direct revelation, uh, led the apostles to set up the church and how they were to worship. Uh, most of us today, we don't study history, so we don't know these things. And uh, we think the way we do church is the way it should be done. That may or may not be true. But I will say much of what you see that is piled off as worship in the church today, it is totally foreign uh, to the way the apostles I'm talking about the, the real apostles, not those today. <laughs> how they worship the Lord. So I'll explain a little bit of that next Sunday. And uh, we're going to be worshiping in that form uh, throughout the summer. So it's going to be songs mixed with uh, the great confessions of the church. And uh, the reason why they confess these things is because they were things that the church really believed and they were essentials to the faith. So that's going to be our form of worship for the summer. Amen. Uh, just do some things differently. Uh, let me make a few more comments before we read this song. Um, first of all, uh, really, Pastor Smith called me this morning and said uh, uh, having issues with his uh, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal system. He had a stomach ache. <laughs> and so uh, pray for him. Pray for uh, Sister Juanita. She called last night uh, uh, some concerns with her health. So pray for her. Uh, high blood pressure, very, very, very high, coming by uh, some bleeding. She gets these real bad nosebleeds to where they get so bad, the blood comes out of her eyes. And so really pray for her that uh, God will bring that blood pressure down and get that under control. Uh, very, 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 very serious thing. Uh, pray for. Um, uh, pray for my father. Um, uh, pray for my uh, my father-in-law. Uh, he's um, bedridden, kind of bedridden, semi, and so it just takes a lot for my dear mother-in-law to uh, take care of him. So pray for her strength. Yes. Um, and so these are the things I specifically hope that we and ask us to pray for today. And others of you, you have prayer requests, uh, let's, let's say them, let's offer them up um, to the Lord. Then I want to say, we all know that uh, Muhammad Ali has passed. And um, I want to make it very plain that uh, I'll start off by saying, as a boy, he was my hero. Um, we all know the stance he took because of his religion and uh, Vietnam. Uh, we all know that uh, some people say he transcended race and all that. I heard somebody say this morning. Um, but as the church, we don't want to mislead anyone. Amen. And that is this. John 14 and 6 is still true. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except it be through me. Um, <laughs> we 
let me say that um, Muhammad did not know the Lord. He didn't know Jesus. And uh, his daughter said in his last dying breath, they chanted over him in Islamic chants. And uh, as the church, we don't want to mislead anyone. Yeah. Only what you do for Christ will last. Amen. And only if you have accepted what he did for you on the cross, will you spend an eternity yeah. with the Lord. Yeah. Acts 4.12 is very clear. There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I, don't any, I don't want any of our young men thinking that you can come to know God through Islam because you cannot. Now, there's only one way to be saved and it is through Jesus. Amen? Amen. And uh, I know some of y'all think that this is out of order. It's not. Because we need to be very careful that as a church, we don't enable people to think that you can be saved any other way besides the gospel. And that is Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day bodily. And salvation is only through him. And so I, 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 I think the real travesty is, is that he died not knowing Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so I want to be clear about that. And Brother Aiden, is this is this is this going on? Is this streaming? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So it's out there on YouTube land. Amen. Amen. And so we don't negate whatever he did. He was a great boxer and all of that. Amen. But we want you to know salvation is only through the gospel. Amen. Jesus died for sins. He was buried. His body rose from the dead. And he is received through repentance of sin and faith in his salvation work Amen. on the cross. Amen? Amen. And uh, I, I feel that I really I really must say that. I really must say that. Amen. I was listening to Minister Farrakhan this week. And he, he, told, he, he instructed some Christians that, look, y'all got it wrong. That Jesus was not born as a result of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. And he said, we all know that no human being can be conceived apart from a human father. And so he denied the virgin birth, which is a denial of the deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I stand on record, Jesus was not just the last great prophet. He was God of very God. God incarnate in the human flesh, born of a virgin. One in the same essence and substance as his father. And so uh, I, I want that to be made plain. So now out in YouTube or wherever you at, you know exactly where I stand and where this church stands Amen. on these things. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the word of the Lord today. This particular song, as I read it this morning, I don't care what you're going through in life. I think this song will express your prayer and what you need uh, from the Lord. And hopefully it expresses how we all feel about our God and our relationship with him. It's a prayer of David, and it is a psalm of supplication and trust in God. So think about whatever you're going through, whatever things you're facing, whatever problems you're facing. And this is our prayer before the Lord this morning. Oh, Lord, our God, Lord, as we read your word back to you, Lord, this is our prayer. This is our supplication of trust and hope in you today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's read the first 10 verses together. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am afflicted in need. Preserve my soul, for I am God in me. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundantly loving kindness to all called on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trial, I shall call upon you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord. 
nor are there any works like yours. All the nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous deeds, you alone are God. Can God's people say amen? Amen. Pastor Smith is not here today, so let me now do double duty. Let us go to our responsive reading, Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Now you all know how this goes, so let's do it. How blessed is the man who does, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatsoever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, they are like shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Verse 6 together. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God give Amen. It is the word of God. Amen. Praise God. Good morning, family. Good morning. Our second song is one of my favorites. It's found on page 577 of our hymn, Hymnal. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. In times like these, oh, praise God.
think it says in the program three through five. I think I want to begin in verse one. We we'll read through verse five. We are still preaching on the doctrines of grace. I'm not quite sure what sermon is this, Sister Margaret. 24. Yes. Been here 24 weeks. Yes. 25. 25, all right. 25 weeks. And we're almost through. Yes. Almost through. We're talking about the perseverance of the saints. First Peter 3. I'm sorry, First Peter 1. I'm going to start at verse 1. And uh, I'll read through uh, 4. And you can read 5 back to me, Peter. An apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. King James says, who are the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest manner. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, Amen. to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Verse 5, read. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, We have been traveling the road of a series called The Doctrines of Grace for quite some time. But we are slowly but surely winding this series down. And then we'll begin a new series, and I'm just simply entitled it, God. The Doctrines of Grace reveal to us why salvation can only be of God alone. And so there are five of them. And in brief, they are as follows. Number one, man is totally depraved. In other words, every aspect of man's being is so tainted with sin that he is, able, he is unable to do anything in securing his salvation, and he has nothing within him which can move God to secure his salvation from his sin. Number two, because man cannot do anything to secure his salvation, God must take the initiative to save him. And we call this the unconditional election of God. So God must save based on his will alone, according to the kind intention of his will. Because man cannot do anything for himself. We've seen over and over and over on your own, you can't turn to God, none seeks God, none understands God. Therefore, if any are to be saved, God must choose them. And it is based on his will alone. And then those who God has chosen for salvation before the foundation of the world. It is to these he gave his son, Jesus Christ. And it is these Christ specifically <coughs> died for on the cross and secured their salvation. And see, we call this a limited or a specific atonement. And so God chooses you, therefore it is you, Christ, died for on the cross. And he really did secure your salvation. And then, those who God chose to be saved before the foundation of the world, those whom Christ specifically died for on the cross, Jesus called them my sheep, I lay down my life on my sheep. It is these that God draws to Christ through his effective or efficacious grace. We call it irresistible grace. It is a grace that is effective. It is a grace that is never in vain. So very simple. You're to pray. You can do nothing. Therefore, God chooses you. Jesus dies for you. And then God draws you to his son by his irresistible, effectual grace efficacious grace that will always end in that individual willingly giving themselves to Jesus 
and repentance and faith. And then the last one, we call it the perseverance of the saints. And the perseverance of the saints is this. Those whom God chose uh, unconditionally, those whom Jesus died for, those whom God drew to Jesus by his grace, these he preserves, or he perseveres with them, or he preserves them from the moment they are saved until they are in his eternal presence, and it is through God's perseverance with the believer that God keeps the believer from falling from God's grace or from falling for their salvation. Amen. You're to pray, you have nothing. God chose you, Jesus died for you, his grace drew you, and then God now he preserves you. And to the day you stand before him in peace, in the eternal presence of God. So it is the last of these doctrines of grace we began to study several weeks ago. And once again, it is called the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints is better called the perseverance of God with the saints. The perseverance of God with the saints is the biblical truth that God perseveres with believers. And he guarantees their salvation from the moment of their conversion until the moment they are safely in his eternal presence. And the evidence that God is persevering with the believer, or let me make it personal, the evidence that God is persevering with you until the day you stand before him in peace is you persevere with God. You hear what I just said? So this is not, you know, this is not the one saved, always saved, therefore now I can live like the devil because grace has it covered. Amen. It's good, I want to doubt. Saved by grace. No, the evidence that you really have been saved by grace is, and the evidence that God has persevered with you until the end is, is you persevere with God. And so even though uh, Christians are by no means perfect humans or perfect Christians, they nevertheless persevere with God. And this is the proof that God is persevering with you. We have seen that the reason why God must persevere with the believer, and I want to say true believers, true Christians, until they are safely in his presence is because of the remnants of sin which remain in believers after conversion unto salvation through faith in Christ. You see, beloved, even though believers are no longer slaves to sin, and even though sin no longer has dominion over our lives, or let me put it down in the vernacular of the streets, even though we no longer live a buff wild life, And we no longer can live in sin or sin apart from the conviction and the chastening of the Holy Spirit. We still have remnants of sin in us. In thought, word, and yes, deed. And so we saw this truth in texts such as Ecclesiastes 7.20. It says, there is no man on earth who continually does good and never sins. So... You know, you might be saved, but you're not a perfect Christian. You're not a perfect human. You're not a perfect anything. Amen. Amen. There is nobody that good but Jesus. Amen. Then we saw in 1 John 1, 8 through 10, which informs us that any Christian who says they do not have a sin nature, they are deceiving themselves, and the truth is not in them. And any Christian who says they do not commit sin, they are calling God a liar. Mm -hmm. And his word is not in them. And so it is because of this remaining sin or the remnants of sin in the believer that God must persevere with the believer and keep us from falling from his grace or from his salvation. Because none of us is stronger than our flesh. Our will is not stronger than your flesh. 
We've all said, I'm not going to do that again. Guess what? We did it again. Amen. About an hour after us. <laughs> We've all said things we should, should not have said. And we think things all the time that are just downright sinful. Amen. And so I've said before and I'll say it again, if God were to all of a sudden just flash behind me on this wall all of our thought lies. I'm talking about in church on Sunday morning. I'm quite sure it would be X-rated, amen. Not fit for anybody to see. And so it is because of that God must persevere with us to the end and keep us. Because apart from him keeping us, we would never remain in grace. And we see this in this first Peter 1, 3 through 5 text we just read. Let me read it again. It says, let me start at verse 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Many of you missed it. This phrase does not say because God knew one day we would turn to him to save us. doesn't say that. It says God, according to his mercy, caused us to be born again. Y'all missed it. It was God in his great mercy, the text says, that caused us to be born again. It was not you. It was he, God who caused us to be born again. Now, you know, a lot of y'all trying high pressure evangelism. I believe in evangelism, I believe in the Great Commission, but listen, listen, we clearly hear the message, but it has to be God who causes the person to turn to him. The apostles understood it, I don't think we do, it is God who has caused us to be born again. A lot of you, you don't know it, but you are still infected with Arminianism. Teach us. I got one teach us and no amen. <laughs> Many of you are still infected with just a little bit of Pelagianism, which you think there's something in a person, a small amount of good by which if you pressure them enough, they will see the light, and they will turn themselves to God. That small amount of righteousness does not exist in man. That good left man in the garden when Adam sinned against God. Yes. It is because that it is because of that that God has to be the one that causes us to be born again. So we witness, we give the gospel, but God is the cause. Yes. Just a few amens. If God don't turn, let me move on. Amen. God opened up the heart of Lydia to receive the things that were spoken by Paul. God has to open up the heart. That doesn't negate us in evangelism, but we need to trust in God, that God opens up the heart. Amen. Not high pressure from you Amen. or from me. Let me move on. Teach us. It's quiet, Jesus. but it's the truth. Amen. It took God to reach you. It's going to take God to reach them. Amen. Now, you know nobody can deal with your hard head itself but God. Amen. And so it's going to take the same thing for those who do not know the Lord. It takes God to break through. We witness, but it takes God to break through. Yes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, Amen. reserved in heaven for you. Amen. Now notice it says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice in verse 4 it says, Christians have an imperishable 
an undefiled inheritance in heaven. Imperishable means it is not going to degrade. You know, um, certain foods are perishable. You know, you can't keep that chicken for four weeks and then eat it. It was in the refrigerator. I don't care. Don't eat it. You better throw it away because it is a perishable food item. Our salvation is imperishable. It will not degrade. Amen. It is undefiled. In other words, there's no impurities in our salvation. Amen. And so it is imperishable in an undefiled inheritance. And notice, the text says it is reserved in heaven for them. You go back to verse 1, Peter is talking to the elect. Yes. It is reserved in heaven for the chosen, for the elect. It is reserved in heaven. And it is ready to be revealed at the last time. But I want you to understand verse 5 says, uh, to those who have this imperishable, undivided inheritance reserved in heaven, it says they are what? Protected yes. by the power of God through faith. And it's faith in Christ for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Therefore, the believer has a reservation in heaven. And the one who makes sure he or her will keep it is God. For he is the one, verse 5, that protects them or keeps them. To the believer fully experiences this salvation in the last day. You know, we have a perfect salvation right now, but we have not fully experienced it. You're still tied down to this body. One day we'll have a glorified body like Jesus. We haven't fully experienced it. We possess it, but we haven't fully experienced it. I've never seen Jesus and neither have you. Because the Bible says Paul was the last one to see him. So you haven't seen God. I haven't seen God. Anybody else who claims they did, they either deluded, mentally unstable, or just a liar. So we haven't seen God. We haven't seen the new heavens and the new earth. We have not seen the pearly white city. We have not seen the streets of transparent gold. We have not seen that tree that bears 12 manner of fruit and the leaves on the tree before the healing of the nation. We haven't experienced all of that yet. But God is going to protect us, keep us, until that day. It is his power that protects us and keeps us until that day. Yes. The word protected in verse 5 is a Greek word, phrogerio. It means to be preserved carefully. Therefore, believers, Christians, or those who have believed on Christ and the salvation, they are preserved carefully by the power of God. Not the believer hold, nor and hold now. Not the believer stand saved by works of the flesh. Not through legalism, not by wearing long dresses, or not by getting your hair cut a certain way, not by abstaining from baseball on Sundays, not by this, not by that, not by abstaining from a movie as we were taught years ago. That's how you want to stay safe. My wife said she was with somebody the other day, and they was all talking about staying safe. Just stay safe. Well, that's a stupid saying. <laughs> it's really ridiculous. Because you can't. We are protected by the power yes. of God. Amen. Yes. If, God, let me, let me, if God was to take his hand off of you today, we'd all be back in wherever you used to go. You'd be back there tonight. Amen. Yes. And you wouldn't even be creeping and peeping. You'd go there boldly. Yes. Believers are kept by the power of God for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Believers are carefully protected by God under salvation, a salvation that will be revealed in the last time when Christ returns, and then we shall fully experience this great redemption we have in Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone. Amen. Last Sunday, we began to study the grounds for belief in the certainty that God will persevere with the believer from the moment of conversion until the day they are in his eternal presence. 
or what is the scriptural truth we stand upon through which we can dogmatically state God will persevere with all true believers, not church folks, but all true believers. Yes. From the moment they are saved to the day they are in his presence and thus guaranteeing their salvation. Amen. Yes. And we did this by looking at what the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1649 states about the guarantee of our salvation by God, but we also compared it to the scripture to see whether what it states is true. And I want to say that I quote the Westminster Confession regarding this doctrine because I believe it accurately summarizes what we find in the New Testament regarding God persevering with believers from the moment they are saved until they are safely in his presence. So I believe that document is succinctly summarized what the Bible really teaches. But more importantly, I believe we are obligated to search the scriptures, Acts 17 11, in order to make sure that what it says is true. So I'm not telling you a scripture, I'm saying it's summarizing what the Bible really says. And, and so let's search the scripture to see whether what it says is true. Amen? Amen. Paragraph in the Westminster Confession says this that states the grounds for the certainty of the believer, of God persevering with the believer, it is as follows The perseverance of the saints does not depend on their own free will. What it's saying is it's not dependent on you holding out and holding on. It's not dependent, and we would say it today, it's not dependent on you climbing up the rough side of the mountain, doing your best to make it in. Amen. It's not dependent upon you running, trying to make 100, 99 and a half won't do. And I've said before, ain't none of us reaching 99 and a half, amen. <laughs> it does not depend upon their own free will, but on the unchangeableness of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father on the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ, Amen. on the continuing presence of the Spirit and the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace. These are the grounds of the certainty and infallibility of their perseverance. Last Sunday we looked at two of them. We know that God is going to persevere with us because of the unchangeableness of his decree or his choice to save us. We studied it over and over and over. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, before the foundation of the world, you are saved. God chose you to be saved. He decreed you to be saved before he made anything. Well, God's decree to save you, it cannot be changed. If you are saved right now, you know somewhere in eternity past, God decreed you to this point. God said you would be saved. God said you would be in his son. God chose you. And so that cannot be altered or changed. Because if it did, that means God got it wrong. Amen. That or God said something that did not come to pass. And if that happens, then God is not really God at all. You need to understand God is not trying to save you. He has. He is. And he shall. God, he, he didn't make a decree and then I'm trying to make it come to pass. God ain't trying to do nothing. God has decreed it. It is so. And no one can change the unchangeable decree of God. And that includes God's choice to save you according to his own will, purpose, sovereign will before the world began. So that is our guarantee. Nobody can change that. And then we looked at the efficacy of the merit of Christ. That is what guarantees our salvation. The efficacy of the merit of Christ through his blood and death on the cross. It is through that God perseveres with true believers. See, Christians, because of what Christ merited or earned for them on the cross, God perseveres with them because of what Jesus merited on the cross for us. God doesn't per persevere with us because we're great people, because we're not. God perseveres with because of what his son did for us on the cross in our behalf. Yes. You see, the scriptures are very clear that Jesus' death on the cross, it sanctifies the believer once for all, and it perfects the believer once for all time. Hebrews 10, 10, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Same chapter, verse 14. For by one offering, as himself on the cross, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. 
The Father perseveres with the believers from the moment they are converted or saved until the moment they are in his eternal presence because Jesus, through his death on the cross, he has sanctified them once and for all. And they have been perfected by that same offering of himself on the cross. They have been perfected by Christ once and for all time. Yes. Yes. It's very simple. If one has been sanctified once and for all, and you have been perfected for all time, such a person like that cannot end up in eternal hell. But then you would have folks sanctified once and for all in hell. And you would have people perfected for all time in hell. Does that make sense to you? No. Now there are many who say, well, you lost your sanctification. And you lost your perfection because you backslid. This is how a true believer can end up going to hell. Well, if they lost their sanctification, then I would argue it wasn't done once and for all, as the Bible says. Amen. Hebrews said when you came to Christ, you were sanctified once and for all. Either it was or it wasn't. Amen. If it's once and for all, you don't lose it. If, if you're perfected for all time, all time by God. Yes. It's forever. Yes. And so you can't have folks sanctified for all time and, 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 and perfected for all time in hell. It doesn't make sense. Now, the reason why many make this mistake is called biblical logic. Part of my doctoral work was in biblical synthesis. Let's think deeply about the Bible. It's the ability to take every book in the Bible in light of the whole. It's the ability to take one verse in light of the whole Bible. We call it harmonizing the scripture. So you can't say you can lose it, and on the other hand say, God gave it to you once and for all. We call it biblical logic. Amen. And way too many of us don't want to think deeply about God. We want to feel God. But we don't want to think about God. We love to shout, but we don't want to think deeply about God. And this is why it has produced all kind of strange fire in the church. Amen? Yes. Think deeply about God. We are changing our purpose statement. And it's, it's coming. And because part of our purpose as Word of God Community Church is to help the Christian who wants to think deeply about the faith Amen. be able to think more deeply Amen. about the faith. That's that. And I said, Lord, you know, God hit me one day. You know, it's nudging me. You know, that's what we do. We want those who like to think, we want to help you to be able to think more deeply about God through his word. Oh, let's move on. Another reason, I'm, I'm only going to look at one today. Another reason why we know we will be, we, we will be saved or God will persevere with us until we're in his presence is the never-ending intercession of Christ before the Father for the believer. The grounds for us knowing God is going to persevere with us is Jesus is always interceding for us. For the Father. Yes. The reason why we know God is going to persevere with us from the moment we are saved to the end, because as we live this life, Jesus is for us yes. and He is interceding for us. He is our great advocate. He is our eternity. He is our attorney. He is our great lawyer. He is our great high priest. And He never stops making intercession for us Amen. until the day we are safely in. His presence. Yes. Yes. Once again, the Westminster Confession says the grounds of the certainty and the infallibility of the perseverance of saints is dependent upon the intercession of Christ. Yes. The scriptures are very clear that Jesus is forever or is always interceding for believers, and it is through his intercession he saves believers, us, forever. For the ground or the basis that the believer will be saved is Jesus' constant intercession for them guarantees it. We read about this in Hebrews 7. Let's go. 7, Hebrews 7, 23. Hebrews 7, 23. We read about this intercession in Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. Notice it says, 
the former priest on the one hand existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Since he always, are you with me today? Since he always, since he always lives to make intercession for them. In verse 23, the author of Hebrews, we don't know who it was, but I suspect it was Paul. He speaks about the intercessional ministry of the Old Testament Levitical priests. The Old Testament high priest is described in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. The Old Testament high priest was according to a strict set of requirements. Or in order for a man to minister in the office of high priest, he had to meet some very strict requirements. First, they had to be from the direct line of heritage of Moses' older brother, Aaron. When they officially ministered in the high priest's office, or when they were making atonement for the sins of the people of Israel, they had the first, number one, so first you've got, you've got to meet this qualification, you are from the line of Aaron. Not somebody else. You could have been a Levite from somebody else's line. Now the Levites that were not from the line of Aaron, they ministered in other things in the tabernacle or later in the temple. But you can only be in the high priest's office if you came through the line of Aaron. So that's number one. And the day they made atonement for the sins of the people, the first thing they had to do was take a bath. And then they will put on a specific set of garments prescribed by God. Yes, yes. Once they put on the holy garments, they then walk from the place where they dress to the tabernacle. And later on, it was Solomon in Herod's temple. They will walk there. Then before they entered the most holy place in the tabernacle of the temple, they had to wash their feet in a brass laver, laver, or pan because so they took this bath and put on the holy garments over here. And then they would leave there and walk to the tabernacle or the temple. But what happened was, as they walked there, their feet were defiled because they walked on ground between getting there. And so it was symbolic that nothing defiled can come in there. So God had to, you wash your feet now before you come up in here. And so they would then wash their feet. Then they could not enter into that holy place until the veil of the temple, which contained the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, they could not enter into the Shekinah glory of God appeared over the seat. So, you know, you got to, he got to have his garments on and wash his feet, bath. He still could not go in until he saw the glory of God appear over the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. If they went in before the glory of God appeared over the mercy seat, they would drop dead on the spot. So for those of you who are impatient, you could not have been a high priest. You would have been dead. In addition, before they entered the most holy place behind the veil, they had to offer up an offering for their own sin first, which consisted of a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So after they confessed their own sin before they went in by offering up this ram and this bull, they would then walk into the most holy place. And that was behind a veil. And behind that veil, it was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. It was always covered up. No, just Nobody could just go back there and look at it. You'd die. I don't know if y'all remember this, but after Israel got, they were, they, they, after they were released from the Babylonian captivity, remember that? And they had the Ark and some guys decided we're going to peep in one day. And the Bible said they had a little crack and peeped in. That's the ark, y'all. It's the mercy seat. And all of them died. <laughs> so it was a veil there that held it up. And so he would make atonement for his sins. 
Then he could walk into the most holy place. And as he went in there, he had to have a pan of hot coals from the altar of the Lord that was to always be kept burning. So they could only uh, they could only burn this incense with a, with 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 a coal from the altar that was to burn perpetually. And, and y'all don't remember, but God is the one that started the fire. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And so they had to keep it burning forever. And you could only take this fire. And minister the things of God. Aaron had two sons, Adab and Abijah. They decided to get some fire from another place one day. The Bible called it strange fire, and God killed both of them. He told Aaron, I don't want to see a tear. I don't want to hear a word. Don't say anything unless I'm going to kill you. Because they knew not to come before me with some strange fire. So they had to have a coal off of the altar that God started the fire. They were to keep it burning. And as he walked in there, he had this pan of hot coals in one hand, and he had a handful of incense in the other. He would then begin the ritual of making intercession for the people of God. He would place this burning pan of burning coal before the mercy seat that sat on the Ark of the Covenant. And then he would sprinkle the incense on it. And the aroma from this incense, it would come up before the altar of the Ark and the um, the ark of the Lord and the mercy seat. If he didn't do it in this exact way, the Bible says he would drop dead on the spot. He would then take some of the blood from the bull he had offered as a sin offering for himself, and he would sprinkle some of it on the east side of the mercy seat. Then he would take uh, some of that same blood from the blood from the from the bull, and he would sprinkle it on the front of the mercy seat seven times. If he did six. They dragged him out dead. You know, and, and, and I, I'm going to finish, but I'm trying to get you to understand what God is teaching us. He has a specific way he wants things yeah. done. Yeah. And we're going to do it his way. God is not pleased. Amen. In the Old Testament, God was so unpleased, he killed people. Now, you, you need to understand that there, there, there's a certain thing, there's a certain way we're supposed to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is when I try to when I try to instill this in this church, because it's not what everybody else is doing, you think we need to get with the program. Because people's churches are growing that do this, Pastor. Well, uh, growing through who? Amen. Let's do this the right way and then let God give us the right numbers. Let me move on. Amen. The high priest would then slay the goat he brought in. He would slay it. The sprinkle of blood from it also on the east side of the mercy seat and seven times in front of the mercy seat. So this is how it would go in once a year and make atonement for the sins of the entire people of Israel. This was the way the Old Testament high priest made intercession for the sins of the people of God. If any other Levite walked in behind the veil while the high priest was doing this, guess what happened to him? He dropped dead on the spot. Now the purpose for the high priest doing all of this is written in Leviticus 16, 16. It says this, he, the high priest, shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgression in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. Hebrews 7 and 23 says these Old Testament high priests, they existed in vast numbers because they, they were prevented from continuing in their ministry because they all eventually died. Amen. The high priest could practice his intercession ministry for 20 years, but given enough time, his intercession for the people would cease because he would die. It was because of this from the time of the first high priest, Moses, elder brother Aaron, and to the last one, a wicked man named Caiaphas, there were many, many high priests for after one died, then another would take his place, and then he would die, and another would take his place, and then he would die, and another would take his place, and then he would die, and this went on and on and on and on and on. Hebrews 7, 24 says, in contrast to these high priests, whose intercession for the people was always cut off because of death, the Bible says, now there is Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, the believer's great high priest, the Bible says, he 
continues forever because death has no dominion over him. All of those Old Testament priests, death had a grip on him. But this God, man, Jesus, death has no dominion over him. So therefore, he can uh, intercede for us forever. Now, Jesus gave death permission to hold him down in the grave for a few days. Understand that. He gave death permission. Because death had no dominion over him. So he gave death permission, but he couldn't hold it down. Third day, he rose bodily from the dead. Yeah. It is because of this Jesus' ministry as high priest, it is forever. Amen. Because Jesus continues forever, or death has no dominion over him. No. Verse 25 says he is able to save forever. Amen. Those who know God the Father through him. Because he always lives to make intercession for them, for his people. He's doing it all the time. This is why Jesus is infinitely superior to the numerous high priests. That is, the Old Testament high priests were hindered in their ministry because death had dominion over them. In contrast, death has no dominion whatsoever over Jesus, and thus his high priestly ministry it continues eternally. It never stops. Amen. Jesus' ministry as our great high priest is also infinitely superior to these Old Testament high priests because, remember, they were under great constrictions as to when they could even enter the holy place. Amen. Now, remember, they could not go behind the veil until the glory of God appeared over the mercy seat. They couldn't go in before the glory of God appeared. But guess what? Jesus had no such restriction. Because he and, he and the Father shared one of the same glory. He didn't have to wait for nothing. When he hit the door, the glory was there. Amen. Thus the glory of the mercy seat is his own glory. The glory he eternally shared with the Father. Jesus entered the most holy place of God based on his own glory. He doesn't have to wait on anybody else as the Old Testament high priest did. The numerous Old Testament high priests were restricted from making atonement for the people because they first had to offer up an offer for their own sin. He doesn't have that restriction because he's infinitely sinless and perfect. He enters the most holy place based on his own sinless merit and perfection. This is what we read in Hebrews 7, 26, where it says, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Just as no one could enter the most holy place but the Old Testament high priest, when he made intercession, lest he drop dead on the spot, nobody else can enter this most holy place of God Amen. and intercede for a Christian or a believer for their sin besides Jesus. Amen. So let me stop. Let me say this. The Old Testament high priest was a shadow, mm -hmm. a type of Jesus' high priestly ministry. Yes. Now listen. You might learn something. When the Old Testament high priest went in there, when he was making intercession for the people, if any other Levite even just peeped in there, God killed him. There could only be one. Likewise, there was only one God man, Jesus, Amen. who could make intercession between Amen. God and the believer, that negates Mother Mary. Are you with me today? Can't nobody else go in there. Mary's out. The, old, the, 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 the Catholic priest, out. Nobody can, nobody can absolve you but Jesus. Oh, my son. Nobody can absolve you from your sins with Jesus. Nobody. Nobody else can go up in there with him. Nobody. That also negates the many Protestant popes we have today who claim to be God's master broker who can work it out for the people. The mere fact that if anybody else went in the high priest, they drop dead, it lets us know no one can do this intercession. 
but Jesus. And those who claim they can, they deserve to die. Just like God killed anybody else who went in behind the veil when that high priest was making intercession Amen. for the people. Are you with me today? Amen. I'm almost done. Yeah, I know some of y'all are going to let me go in there, but I must. We must exalt Jesus over everybody. Yeah. Amen. Now, the reason why Jesus is this kind of high priest who forever lives to constantly make intercession for Christians is because none of us are perfect. And none of us are entirely free from sin. Even though we don't live in sin like the world of unredeemed humanity. Even though we're not buck wild party people. Even though some of us, you know, we've gotten off of that party train. What's that song used to say? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know, know what the party train is. Come on in. I forget the name of the group. You done jumped off the party train. Even though we've jumped off, we still have sin issues. The reason why Jesus never stops going to see them Christians is for the same reason the Old Testament priest went into that most holy place, and that is to make atonement for the sins of the entire people of God. Jesus is constantly making intercession for every believer. It was the Gap Band. There y'all go. Amen. <laughs> y'all looking at me funny. I know y'all was on that Gap Band party today. God brought that to my remembrance. <laughs> Some of y'all will go home and Google that. I don't know. I should have said <laughs> Jesus is constantly making intercession for every believer. Amen. Even for those who are born to believe they can lose their salvation. He's even interceding for them. Amen. It is really a saying that many believers cannot really have joy in their salvation because they live in constant fear of losing it. They never experience the joy of their salvation because they are too busy not enjoying their lives because they're trying to hold on and hold out in their salvation, fearing they might lose it. Mm. It's really going to be a shame when they come before the Lord and find out Jesus had their salvation worked out all along because he never stopped interceding for them. Amen. Jesus always makes intercession for believers because until we leave this world, our flesh is with us. And this body of flesh has remnants of sin in it which will never be gone until we are given our glorified bodies upon Christ's return. It is because of the fact that the remnants of sin are always active in us, even though we don't live like the ungodly, that Jesus intercedes for us all the time before the Father. When believers sin, no matter whether it's done intentionally or unintentionally, Jesus is always pleading our case for the Father as our great high priest. Amen? When you and I as believers do something or say something or think something, which is sin, Jesus is always making it right between us and the Father. And Jesus cannot fail in this intercession for us. It is utterly impossible for Jesus to fail in working it out between us and the Father because he is perfect God and perfect man. And as the perfect God man, he cannot get it wrong. He can never fail in interceding for us. He will never lose one case because he is the God man. <laughs> he doesn't lose cases. Amen. You know, even Perry Mason lost one case. <laughs> No, y'all don't remember that, do you? Y'all remember that? Y'all, y'all young folks, y'all, y'all don't know good TV. Eh? There was one case Perry lost. Jesus ain't lost nothing, and never will. In view of this, the only way a believer could end up being lost or lose their salvation if Jesus stopped interceding for them, or he failed in his intercession. But since he never ceased in his intercession for his people, and he cannot lose one believer in his intercession, believers, Jesus' people, can never be lost. <laughs> Jesus perseveres with his people until they are in his eternal presence by always making perfect intercession for them, and this is how he saves us forever. 
If you are truly redeemed because you really do believe Jesus is the Son of God, he was put to death for your sin, was there, but rose bodily from the dead on the third day, it is impossible for him to lose you to hell. Because he cannot lose as your great high priest who forever lives to make intercession between you and the Father. This is the grounds of the certainty of God persevering with the believer from the moment of their conversion to the moment they are safely in his eternal presence. Amen? I'm out of here. Amen. Amen. Our gracious heavenly Father, the author will just come. Our gracious heavenly Father, the Lord. I pray that we are really, 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 really learning about our salvation and learning our salvation is of God alone. I pray that we are really learning why we must teach total depravity in this election. Limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. Because it is how God saves us. It is why salvation is of the Lord alone. Lord, we thank you as we read in 1 Peter that you are the cause through your great mercy, you are the cause for us being born again. And Lord, I thank you for persevering with me. I honestly know if God not persevering with me, there's no way I would ever be saved. I've learned after almost 40 years of Christian living the hold on and hold now, it only leads to utter frustration. Because you can do well for a while and say something or do something or think something and just blow it. But Lord, I thank you, even in the time that we blow it as a Christian, and let us all be honest, we have those times. Even during that, Jesus is saying to the Father, Father, they're all right. Yes, Lord. I've sanctified them once for all. And I've perfected them for all time through my sacrifice for them on the cross. Lord Jesus, I so thank you. I magnify you. And Lord, therefore, I exalt you above all others. Separate from sinners, undefiled, he is even exalted above the heavens. This is our great high priest, Jesus, the God-man and the man-God. Lord, we thank you. Lord, help us all of us to understand it's not by us, not by our works, but it is by your grace and mercy alone. But Lord, also let us, let us never forget the proof that God is persevering with us is that we persevere in the things of God. Yes. True believers never have this attitude that now that I'm saved, I can do anything I want. Amen. Even though we're not perfect, not perfect Christians, not perfect humans, we persevere with God. Paul says it like this. He said, I've been knocked down, but never out. Many times we go down, but it's never for the count because yes. Jesus always picks us up. Yes. And we persevere in the things of God. Amen? Amen? The gospel is very clear. Jesus died for your sins on the cross. He was buried. And he rose again on the third day bodily. And that is proof that he really is the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. It is not through Islam. It is not through Mormonism. It is not through Catholicism. It is not through Protestantism. It's not through Eddie Long, thank God. Amen. It's not through the Pope. It's not through Dr. Ken Lowe. It's not through Church of God in Christ. 
It's not through Presbyterian reform. It's not through any of that. Acts 4.12, there is no other name given under heaven by which, where which men must be saved other than the name of Jesus. And so, if you want to see God in peace, you can only do it by coming to Jesus Christ. Perhaps there's one today God has been dealing with you for the salvation of your soul. It is through repentance and faith in Jesus alone. There is one today. If you are a female, we have a, a female altar worker, a male, male altar worker. Is there one today and you feel so led to just raise your hand today? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we have stayed true to the gospel this morning. Amen. Lord, we're going to continue to plant and water and trust in you for the increase. Perhaps there's another today you're already saved. I always say this because I really mean it. It's always low pressure because we want you to be where God wants you to be. If there's one today and you believe God wants you to be a member of this church, and you feel so led by the Spirit, no pressure, none of that stuff. Uh, if there's one today and you want to do this, would you raise your hand? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we, we, we pray for those who do not know the Lord. We pray that they will be convicted by the Spirit of God and their need for Christ. And Lord, we pray that they will turn to Jesus Christ in the salvation of their soul. Lord, I pray for believers today. I pray, pray for specific people in this church. Sister Fran still recuperating from surgery. Uh, Sister Juanita is not here today. Pastor Smith under the weather. Others just going through a lot of difficulties in life. We pray for them. Pray for my father-in-law. Uh, my father. Uh, it's, it's just... It's just It's, it's really a struggle to take care of someone who's ill. And so it takes a lot of compassion and mercy and grace. And uh, I see it with my father. I never thought I'd live to see the day that he would forget how to shave himself. And so, you know, I have to go down there and, and do what we need to do and, and, and make sure he shaves and get him a haircut. I remember when he did that with me, taking, to me, taking me to the barber. When I wanted an asshole, he wouldn't let me have one in here. I took him to the barber the other day, and he told me the barber took too much off. And so the roles are kind of reverse. But Lord, give us the strength to do what we need to do because we're supposed to do it. Amen? And so Lord, lead us in God's Lord, give us strength. Lord, there's somebody who desperately need a job. And so we trust, Lord, you have that job for them. Lord, open up that door that no man can close. And close the one that does not need to be open. Father God, we praise you and thank you for all things. We pray in Jesus Christ's name that God's people say amen. 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 We're going to ask the men to come. Amen. Let's pray, our precious Heavenly Father. We thank you for this opportunity to share our financial resources uh, for the work of the Lord. Our Lord, bless those who want to give, they just don't have it. Bless those who really, really desire to give more, they just don't have it. And so, Lord, bless it. And as the scriptures say, make all grace abound in order that your people will always have those necessary things of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.